I feel like every time I play the drums, it's a celebration. I'm celebrating the fact that I can play the drums. Greg Anton learned to love playing the drums at age five, but an attempt at a homemade firework took away his left hand and his ability to play the music he loved. I remember every single detail. It was a pretty traumatic, I almost died from loss of blood. But Anton refused to live his life without his music, so he found a way. And then I just carried on, okay. I had an artificial hand, and I just took some rubber bands and tape and put a drumstick in the hand and just started playing. I didn't think of it as an insurmountable challenge. I just did it. Eventually, Anton came up with a more permanent solution. He contacted renowned jazz drummer Peter Erskine and convinced him to make a mold of his left hand. A prosthetic Anton now uses to perform. The drummer Peter Erskine, he came with me to the prosthetic device company, stuck his left hand in a five gallon bucket of goop while he held the drumstick, and this is his hand. Anton has jammed in more than 1,300 concerts, many with major stars like John Lee Hooker, Otis Taylor, and Nicky Hopkins, and members of the Grateful Dead. I never became a drummer. I was born a drummer. I didn't decide to play the drums. I am the drums. I'm Daniel Anderson. I'm currently a journalism student, but I want to make documentaries for a living. And this project is the first step in that goal. I know what it's like to face a disability. I have spinal muscular atrophy, type two. I got my first electric wheelchair when I was five years old. For me, this project is not just academic, it's also personal. Attending school at a major university brought some challenges. Getting into buildings, up ramps, and into restrooms takes a toll. But the emotional drain was the worst. For much of my life, I've adapted to a world that tried to convince me to stay behind the scenes, especially in a culture where many don't see people with disabilities as the sexy face in front of a camera. I grew to be comfortable being the inconspicuous man behind the curtain. So I took a position as writer and producer in our student newsroom. But then I found inspiration and motivation in the arts. Moments like the film The Greatest Showman lifted my spirits to take a more active role in my life. I am bruised, I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. This song became my anthem, the song of the forgotten and the outcast. People who decide to take control of their own destiny. I make no apologies. This is me. So here I am, stepping out of the shadows and onto the stage looking for people like me who have overcome the world to pursue their dreams. This is me, Daniel Anderson, executive producer, sexy face, and your guide to this documentary. This is who I'm meant to be. This is me. After the School of Communications approved my project, I started looking for others with disabilities also pursuing their dreams. Say no, I'm in. I saw Ali Stroker accept the Tony Award for Best Featured Actress for her role as Ado Annie in Oklahoma. The first person with a disability to get nominated and also the first to win. This award is for every kid who is watching tonight who has a disability, who has a limitation or a challenge, 
who has been waiting to see themselves represented in this arena. You are. This moment filled me with hope that an inclusion revolution would begin. But COVID swiftly stole the global stage. I needed to know more about this movement, so I reached out to her, but never heard back. So I contacted others like her who did agree to speak with me. Every time I would do a speech, just like an eight-year-old, I would always make a joke about how I couldn't reach the podium. I did a Zoom interview with Nick Novicki from Los Angeles, where he redefines Hollywood one project at a time. I'm a comedian, actor, writer, producer, and I'm the founder and director of the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. But I'm a little short. He prefers the term little person, a feature he used to build his career in the entertainment industry. I think it's just instinctual. Come on, guys. I just always was the one that wanted to get up and make a speech. And I think possibly if you were to look, you know, from a wider lens or deeper, <laughs> I think probably growing up in the Northeast. You know, like I hear somebody like, fall, penguin, fall. You're a penguin. And being a little person, I was also good at using comedy to avoid getting picked on and to just kind of ease the tension. Um, and so it was a natural instinct and something that I love to do. What if I can get us a raise? No, Vicky found that he had to write parts for himself because no one else would. Early in my career, I realized that I'm three foot 10. I only look like a child. And if I wanted to be the romantic lead or the gangster, I was gonna have to learn how to write the role, produce the role, create it, to play the kind of roles I wanted to play. What do you see when you look at me? When it came to TV and film, I, I was limited. Because all you see is the dwarf. So by producing and creating my own content, that led to opportunities. That built my reel, that built my network, and that allowed me to hire myself, hire other people, and have those people hire me. With Easter Seal, Southern California really took it to the next level. Because That's why I created the Disability Film Challenge is an opportunity to help other people with disabilities take their career in their own hands and make the content that they wanted to do and also to be able to hire each other. Do you consider and identify yourself as part of the disability community? Yes. I realized quickly that I needed face-to-face -face interactions to do these stories justice. So I started trying to set up in-person interviews, but I soon found out the cost of my project raised some eyebrows. My travel budget was three times what the School of Communications normally spent on a student project. And they said, we can't fund this. This is beyond anything that we've ever done before and we can't justify you expending this much money for one student to do a project. And I said, we're going to include this in the documentary because this illustrates perfectly the impediments that people with disabilities face when they try to do things. So you've got to decide. Do you want Daniel to do something, or do you just want him to roll around here in his wheelchair until he graduates? It turns out that inclusion costs money. And to their credit, the School of Communications generously funded my project. We wanted to support this. We wanted to make it work. And one of the questions that always came up is, if we scaled back this budget, is this going to impact at all the quality and the ability of Daniel to really capture this story and as long as we felt satisfied that it wouldn't impact it, the support was there uh, to help out in any way we could. The fact that you chose something that was very close to you, that you felt a passion about, that would have a social impact, you could see that because this was very dear to your heart, it drove you. It'll be a blast. I'm honestly here to show the obstacles that people like me have to go through to share what they have to offer with the world. That's not just one project, that's my whole life. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Navigating the airport isn't easy for anyone. But as you will see, it creates a big challenge for me. We need to be very careful. My dad and my brother helped me get inside the airport. Ready to do this. And then they and three other people jumped in to help me get on the plane. All right, let's move over and down. He's a rock star. My foot is right stuck. Here. My $40,000 electric wheelchair went into the luggage compartment and they put me into this airport approved wheelchair. 
Is there any way you could get on that side? Once inside, they lifted me into a window seat. One, two, three. On the left side of the plane. This is always the most tiring part of flying. But once I'm settled in, it's, uh, it's a blast. It's important because they deserve the right to be able to travel like everyone else and, um, you know, do what we can to make them as comfortable as possible and accommodate them as best that we can. You know, everybody deserves to be able to travel. The adventure continues. The nearly four hour flight wore me out. It took me more than 40 minutes to get off the plane. My back would not been able to take anything more than what we just did. Get back into my wheelchair that thankfully arrived unscathed and set off to pick up our luggage. But when I turned on my phone, I had a text from the van driver. He's been here and gone already? Yeah. I just found out that the guy has left. I admit, I emotionally shut down at that point. It's frustrating and it's exhausting. But my father did not. And that's when he comes in and he, and he lays the smack down. I really don't understand how someone in your business that rents vehicles to people with disabilities could have calculated that 40 minutes was enough to get off the plane, claim luggage, and meet you. I've kind of become, I think, a little numb to it. So my dad decided he would go, pick up the van, and drive it himself. An hour and a half later and we are off. I'm glad we're getting moving. I'm in Washington, D.C. today because I, like so many people in the disability community, have overcome a lot to pursue my art. And we all look to this city and the leaders here as our last hope. Shortly before signing the ADA into law, President George Herbert Walker Bush said, together we must remove the physical barriers we have created and the social barriers that we have accepted. For ours will never be a truly prosperous nation until all within it prosper. We will not accept, we will not excuse, we will not tolerate discrimination in America. In 1990, a thousand people gathered outside the steps of the Capitol building, throwing themselves out of their wheelchairs and crawling up the steps in the hope that the nation will hear their cries for equality and accessibility. Access now! Access now! Passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act took a lot of time and a lot of work from people who dedicated their lives to inclusion and accessibility. I've been doing disability rights work since I was very young. When I grew up in the 1950s, there were no laws in place that uh, protected disabled people from discrimination. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I met Judy Human several years ago at a conference in Washington, D.C. at the annual meeting of the National Council on Independent Living. In 1970, I applied for a teaching license in Brooklyn and was denied my teaching license. I had to take a written exam, an oral exam, and a medical exam, and I was failed on the medical exam and passed the oral and written and uh, ultimately sued the Board of Ed and got my teaching license. Human worked as a public school teacher in New York City for several years. But after seeing how she had tirelessly advocated for her community, many disability groups and government agencies tried to recruit her. We'd had demonstrations in New York City where we shut down traffic, demonstrations in Washington, D.C., when President Nixon vetoed Section 504 in the Rehabilitation Act. 504 was one of the first major anti-discrimination provisions in law that made it illegal to discriminate against someone with a disability if the entity got money from the federal government. We will accept no more discussion of segregation, and I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. Her efforts helped the passage of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which laid the groundwork for the Americans with Disabilities Act. And President Clinton asked her to serve as a special envoy on disability rights at the United Nations. I know I'm not an ordinary kid. We were also beginning to really focus on the issue of media. So if you go back and look at the 504 demonstrations in 1977, we were definitely looking at the fact, why is representation of disabled people in media important? 
And what many of us were talking about then, and certainly still are now. Look at me and tell me what you see. Is when we don't see ourselves, it's not just that we're not seeing ourselves. It's that society is only seeing typically you negative images. Little urchin in the front row. Won't you share your thoughts with the whole class? A study done by the Annenberg Inclusion Institute looked at 50,000 characters and found that only 2.5% had disabilities. Yet in the US, one in five Americans fall into that category. You can't stand. The ovation is insensitive. Everybody down. Human says that media representation has come a long way. You're a freak. But that there's still a long way to go. The inclusion of disabled people from broad backgrounds is really important, but it's still so limited. What I do believe is very positive is that disability is moving forward more rapidly, but it's still absent in so many ways. I love Judy. She tends to be very blunt and to the point. Okay, well, we can just do it ourselves. She asked me about my project and if it would add anything to the conversation and challenged me to find something unique and make sure what I say is something people care about. She made me think, and I like that. Her advice made me reflect on the true purpose of my project and whether the challenges that I face in pursuing my dreams are reflected in the disability community as well. So I sought out my primary audience, hey, people hi. like me, who live with disabilities day in and day out. Disability representation matters because I want to feel seen and heard. There's never been like just a guy who's just paralyzed and yeah, that's it, it's just normal. So I wish there was more of that, you know? It really, really empowers me to be able to feel like I am seen and represented and known in that way. I just figured other people might get representation, but not me. I've, I've seen pieces of me on screen, but I'm still waiting for the real thing. Whenever I see someone else with hearing aids, it makes me feel like they're special, including me. And like, I kind of belong to them. How do you follow your passion? I think people do care, and they need to see people like them pursuing their dreams. People like Kate. Helping the kids as best I can. I think I'm really good at that. Kate works as a teaching assistant at the Tanner Dance Studio in Salt Lake City, where she learned how to dance and now teaches children to do the same. I have been dancing for 41 years. When Melinda dances, she lets go of her inhibitions. And when it came time to talk, her feelings became clear. I feel better when I am dancing. Andy started dancing when he was young, but it's part of who he is. I was born to dance. You can go anywhere we want, okay? Joni Wilson works with a dozen performing groups. She says that her students don't have disabilities. Are they fabulous? I think we see things not in terms of impediments, but in terms of what possibilities there are. We see potential. Seeing their passion made me think about what the future holds for me and other people with disabilities. Times Square, let me hear your voice! Those thoughts led me to Sparsh Shaw, an accomplished young singer-songwriter living in New Jersey. I have osteogenesis imperfecta. So that, in layman's terms, is like brittle bone disorder. Like, I'll own the label disabled, because if that's the way the world wants to see me, go ahead and see me. In the spirit of the poem, my angel. But that label doesn't slow Shaw down. Hey, let's be real. People remember how you make them feel. So do unto all this for short to woe. Well. Watch a billion eggs begin to grow. Tomorrow's unknown, and that's OK. The past is gone, just love today. Yeah, I know I am. Shaw's family immigrated from India, a culture he loves and reflects in his music. In addition to his music, Shaw visits a lot of big companies and does motivational speaking. Thank you, we did! In December 2015, I actually got the chance to do a TED Talk. I want to leave my footprints, or rather, 
track prints into the sand of legacy so deep, not even a tsunami can erase it. And I firmly believe that every one of us here should strive for such big goals. I mean, don't you all want to be remembered when you leave this earth? Thank you so much! To be honest, long air travel damages my health. So two of my classmates flew to New York and did the interview with Shaw. So excited to see Sparsh! After spending more than four hours with Sparsh at his home in Island, New Jersey, Elena and Kat found him kind, inspiring, and multi-talented. So many lives snuffed out by hate, it's impossible to contemplate. Its meaning will only keep us guessing. May their memories be for blessing. Every day's a gift, so I'm blessed and grateful. Life's just a test who wins, only a handful. So what are we gonna do? Shaw says he doesn't view his condition as a disability, but as an opportunity. I can definitely show you where I'm at in my life and take you along the journey with me. And whatever you want to take from it, that's up to you. Life is a journey, and everyone experiences ups and downs. Along our path, we meet people who inspire us because we see their passion and potential despite the rough road they may be on. Live your life, be kind. I've never been disadvantaged, I'm differently advantaged, so I'm just differently able. If we listen, we also find those that will direct us and advocate for us to help level out the peaks and climbs that we may face. You're in this because you love it, and so enjoy the process. My dream is that we're not ashamed of our disabilities, that we speak up and out about who we are. Everyone fails, but falling down isn't the problem. Not getting up is the problem. Finding a way to turn disappointment into opportunity. Once we tell somebody with some gumption and thought that they can't do something, then they find a way to do it. I admit, in the past, I've wallowed in self-pity, allowing my doubts and fears to stop me in my tracks. I've asked, why me? And felt like my path has been bumpier than others. But I've come to realize that all paths have difficulties and everyone comes to a point where they feel like giving up. But the true test of character is in how we respond. Do we adapt to our circumstances and allow our passion to free our spirits? Thank you. Do we reach for the impossible dream that could shape a generation? Or do we simply live every day grateful for the path laid before us? As I say, Sparsh means touch in Sanskrit. So I'm really blessed to be able to go to all these places and Sparsh people's hearts. That's what I want to do. The path ahead may seem daunting, but that's where the adventure awaits. I hope that everyone who sees this documentary is able to reflect on the beauty and challenges and the strength in disability. My challenges are not going to be the end of my story or this message, because like everyone, I am strong, I am capable, and I am limitless. <laughs>